it's summer 2018, I've been offered this job by this lady called Sharon, and at the beginning I just wanted something that, I guess it was literally putting my head in the sand, it was finding something that I didn't need to worry about next week or next month, and it's just very in the moment, and I guess that's what island life very much is. And so my day is, to be honest, on the one hand, a bit of a dream. I was waking up maybe at seven in the morning, going swimming in the sea or more splashing and starting a shift maybe 10 or 11 in the morning. And so it was deserted. It was like literally I had the most pristine Greek beaches all to myself, doing everything from making cocktails to cleaning rooms to working the bar and the reception and meeting people. And it was an idyllic way of living. I was very upfront with my boss to say, look, I've got this thing that I'm adjusting to, but if I'm here, I'll work and I'll, I'll contribute and I'll do everything that I can do. I might push back if you're asking me to carry heavy things or something, but other, aside from that, let's crack on. And she was amazing, because I think a lot of other people in that situation probably wouldn't have given me a go. And I feel like I was very, very overqualified and underqualified, because I'd worked in a hotel about 20 years ago. And if they know now, working behind the bar, making cocktails, someone would order a drink, I'd YouTube it quickly and tell them to wait by the pool and I come and bring it to them and it was all fine but just those moments I remember just being so satisfied and, and again it was very in the moment and intentional. I couldn't think you know in that moment of making the cocktail nothing else was a problem <laughs> just like making sure that drink got out. The good advice I got at the beginning of the season was that if it tastes of alcohol they're not going to complain so I always made it sure it was topped up. And what was great was as well that I said to my boss look I've got a wedding in July for a few days in London so I want to go back for that. She was just flexible around what I needed and understood. And I do remember though on the first day calling my partner, being in floods of tears, thinking, what am I doing here? And it was a bit of a shock to the system. And I was also walking a lot because within a small space, just a small hotel and everything, everyone needs to do everything and stuff. But at the same time, I, I think I was probably the healthiest and fittest that I've been and so it was a really I'm going to say look it was a great distraction I was sharing my room with a, a an older man who had the early onset of Parkinson's as well and it was quite a an interesting dynamic of me being still relatively young and him also and like adjusting from a medication perspective and sharing kind of stories and everything that was going on and it felt like we were both meant to be there for some day there was just something in me that was like okay that, that was yeah I guess a very I'm gonna say special time. I went back to London though for the weekend for this wedding and what was interesting was I started not feeling very well in the time that I went back and I remember friends and family being concerned oh you're gonna you're gonna be away and from a doctor's perspective and how will that be and that was maybe partly the attraction of in a bit of denial and just wanting to live in the moment. Back in London for this wedding, again, I think it was very humid and I just felt I was struggling to breathe. I remember going to the doctor and they did a blood test and my something called a BNP protein levels raised, which I've, I've mentioned before, I'll mention again. It was when I was first diagnosed, it was about 3,000. And when I had this test then, it was now at 5,000. I just remember being concerned, but then at the same time thinking, London's not great for me and I want to get back. I was feeling good in, in Greece, so I'm going to, I'm going to head back and, and hopefully that will be okay. And I registered actually with a doctor in Mykonos, a cardiologist, just so that I had peace of mind if I needed something or someone was there. Over the course of the summer, I was really stable. I was really in, enjoying life. And it was exactly, I think, everything that I really, partly a dream that I really wanted it to be. I remember towards the end of the summer, organizing a dinner for all the small team that worked in the hotel. And I just said to the owner, be a really nice thing to do before we all disappear at the end. I remember Sharon going, oh, that's a nice idea. And I went around the table and shared. And I just remember saying, I really wanted at the beginning of the summer to be like summer 2018, this happened or something, this was great. And I know that was achieved. Um, and again, there were ups and downs and arguments and I'm sure we could have been on something like Below Deck or <laughs> one of the TV programs, um, Island Life Uncovered or something, maybe not that extreme, but there were definitely moments that were challenging. But at the end of the day, it was exactly that summer 2018 to, to remember. I did a test as well for the BMP protein before in Greece before I came back to London just to see. And it was back down again. Look, in hindsight, it was another, I think, good decision to make an amazing experience. There was also, though, constantly in the back of my mind, the need to get this relator installed. I remember towards the back end of the trip thinking, I want to speak to someone who's had this fibrillator put in so that I've got more of an understanding of it. And yeah, I guess partly one of the reasons why I'm sharing here is there's always going to be someone behind me 
on this journey and every day new people being diagnosed. And if I can hopefully share with other people, again, in this ex example I'm about to give, what they shared with me, then that can be extremely useful. So I remember I contacted the British Heart Foundation and said, could you introduce me to someone perhaps of a similar age who has also had this, or maybe they're younger, but similar. So from a relatable perspective, that would be super useful. So they put me in touch with this guy and I just remember calling him, I was sitting outside and he shared with me that again, everyone's got their own journey and slightly different story. He was in the gym and suddenly he had a cardiac arrest. He was able to be revived, which again, I think statistics, I don't want to give a wrong statistic, so I'll put it in the notes, comments afterwards, but the, the chances of survival from cardiac arrest aren't that great. Let's just put it like that. Anyway, he was managed to be revived, went to hospital, and they said you needed to have a defibrillator put in. And there are two main types. One's called a subcutaneous ICD, and that kind of goes in and sits on top of the heart. And then the other one is more integrated. And so again, it was a really useful insight to understand perhaps what the different types are, and also to help inform me what questions I should be asking the doctors when it comes to my turn. So he said he had this installed and Hanaha, he said to me, it saved my life six times. And I just, it was like a penny drop moment of, I had this anxiety of it being very permanent, it being like quite a big device and being concerned that this has changed forever. And it was a weird, um, just, I guess some anxiety around that. I'm trying to put my finger on exactly what the anxiety was because it's going to save my life if I need to so I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment but his story was three times it went off he was just like lying in bed and he was just either asleep or relaxing and it suddenly shocked him and then the other times were he was in the gym doing workout and again and it shocked him but again had he not had it the chances are that it would have been it would have been fatal and so it really made me think okay on the flip side when I originally didn't want it I'm now kind of anxiety that by not having it what happens if then something happens I guess they also said it's really important to mentally be in the right position to want it and I think that was also at the beginning of the summer when they told me I just had the good news that I didn't need a transplant and now they're telling me that I needed this and I just remember thinking not now but I know that I need it and I just want a bit of maybe it's me wanting to control something anything but it was then ready once he I'd had that conversation it was hugely informative and it really made me think okay these are the questions I need to ask and this is a really important next step that you know, I, I'm crazy if I put this off and I really just need to go, go and get this done. And so I'm really grateful to the British Heart Foundation and also to this person for, for sharing so honestly with their story. And I felt like there was no pressure and I could ask anything that I wanted and it was super, super useful. So again, I'd encourage you at any stage that you're at with, with a condition, whether it be heart related or otherwise, that you're not the same necessarily, speaking to someone that's already been through the process and also like the recovery time. So there are certain things like concerned about that so that was decision made contacted the doctors say look I'll, I'll be back in October and that I'd like to move forward with this and so that started off those next stage conversations thanks for watching feel free to check out the British Heart Foundation Cardiomyopathy UK and Save Nine Lives for more information why not comment on the video tell me what you think or ask a question and subscribe to the channel to continue to follow my journey